Hi, this is Karen Brown. Thanks for checking out the Mississippi Edition podcast. If you like what you hear, click subscribe, hit like, or leave us a comment if your app has that feature. Then find other MPB podcasts by searching MPB Think Radio on your favorite podcasting platform. Thanks. Good morning. It's 8.30 on Friday, September 10th. I'm Karen Brown, and this is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. On today's show, Samaritan's Purse packs up its field hospital. Then, Mississippi's largest school district eschews mask mandates. And the story of the first Power 5 football game after 9-11. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Samaritan's Purse is a major Christian humanitarian aid charity led by celebrity evangelist Franklin Graham. When Mississippi's COVID-19 cases spiked in August, the organization sent a fully staffed field hospital to the University of Mississippi Medical Center in Jackson. Now they're packing up. Desiree Fraser spoke with Alyssa Benson, who works with Samaritan's Purse. Right now, the COVID cases are decreasing in Mississippi, um, and this is around the time frame that we originally discussed with the University of Mississippi Medical Center to begin dismantling our field hospital. Um, Their team feels like they are capable to take on the extra COVID caseload. It's become a manageable number, so we're thankful to be here and wrapping up our, our work here. How long have you been here? We have been here for about three and a half weeks, going on four weeks. Um, We opened on August 18th, and since then we have treated 65 COVID-19 patients. And tell us a little bit about the build-out and then having to put all this away. We are self-contained. We basically have these tent field hospitals that are always sitting in our warehouse warehouse ready to go. Um, And so when we worked with the University of Mississippi Medical Center and the government of Mississippi, um, recognizing the need here during COVID-19, we basically packed those field hospitals into two tractor trailers and shipped them from North Carolina. Um, And so we got here on the ground um, and then we began setting up. It took about two to three full days to fully set up our emergency field hospital and begin accepting patients. And so we had a 32-bed field hospital here, and our doctors and nurses continued to care for these patients 24-7. Like I said, we cared for 65 patients here. Now that that has been completed and COVID numbers are decreasing, our team is packing up the field hospital. And as most things, it takes a shorter amount of time to dismantle than it did to assemble. So uh, our teams are, are working all day to get these field hospitals packed up, back on those trucks, and back um, to North Carolina. There are some things that can't be saved just because they were in the COVID hot zone. So those are disinfected and then um, destroyed. And then we're saving a lot of our medical supplies and things that we can't necessarily ship back to North Carolina and leaving them for the, the hospital here. Well, that'll be a help for them. Are all of the medical staff gone? They are no longer performing medical uh, abilities, but they are here helping our team dismantle the tents. What do you think was the most challenging thing for you in being here and treating COVID patients? Yeah, I think um, for medical staff around the country and around the world, this has just been a really hard year and a half. Um, A lot of the heart behind our nurses and doctors is that they want to serve their patients and they want to show them love and care in the best of their ability. And so when you add face shields and you add personal protective equipment in the midst of that, it makes it a little bit more challenging. But our doctors and nurses, Samaritan's Purse doctors and nurses, they are here to show the love of Christ to their patients through their actions to provide that physical care, but also provide that emotional care and just sit and listen if they need to talk. Um, A lot of these patients are far from their families because of this disease and so we want to just be the people that are there um, with them and a comfort to them in this time of of difficulty. And treating them after you treated them in this field hospital where did they go were they released what was the next step for these patients? 
So we are working alongside the University of Mississippi Medical Center. We have been since the beginning. They are first triaged through their hospital and then sent to our tents, and then they go back to the hospital to be discharged. So they um, meet a certain amount of criteria in order to reach that requirement of being discharged, um, but they are actually discharged through the hospital. So we celebrate with them as they leave our town hospital, but then they're sent back to receive further care and discharge. How do you feel you were received? Good. I mean, you know, Samaritan's Purse runs into the hard places, and this is one of those hard places during this time, and we were just completely supported and welcomed by this community. People delivered meals to us. They were coming, making signs for our team, saying thank you. Um, and so we're just really grateful to be able to serve your community in this way. What happens next? Where do you go from here? We go wherever we're needed. So this tent hospital is um, equipped to respond after disasters and also after COVID-19. And so our teams are continually monitoring the news around the world, disasters happening around the world, and we're always ready to respond um, where there's a need. You've been to Louisiana helping Hurricane Ida victims. Right now, our teams are on the ground in southeast Louisiana after Hurricane Ida hit as a Category 4 storm. Um, so we are working in three locations in Hammond, Homa, and New Orleans, Louisiana, to help these families get back on their feet after they've lost everything. Um, our teams of volunteers are mobilized from across the United States, and they're helping families remove down trees, tarp roofs, clear debris, things like that, so that they can get back in their homes and, and get back to normal. How do you stay motivated? You know, Samaritan's Purse is a Christian organization, and my main hope and motivation in life is to just glorify God above all else. Um, I believe he's give, given each of us gifts and abilities and talents that he can use and work through us to glorify him and serve others. And no matter what area of our ministry we're helping in, whether it's hurricanes, whether it's COVID-19, whether it's earthquakes in Haiti right now, um, we want to do that to glorify God and show others the love of Christ while also meeting their physical needs. When do you think you'll be leaving? Um, so our team should be uh, packed up and ready to leave by Friday afternoon, but we would have team, uh, team members here on the ground through Sunday just to make sure everything goes smoothly, the uh, pass-off goes smoothly, and then everyone can go home and get some rest. Thank you so much. Thanks, Desiree. Several Mississippi school districts initiated mask mandates in August as the Delta variant of COVID-19 ravaged classrooms throughout the country. But the DeSoto County District, which is the largest in the state, is standing pat. Kobe Vance spoke with Dr. Matthew Reese, who's a pediatrician and a DeSoto County resident. We're still seeing pretty substantial spread here in DeSoto County, and unfortunately it's impacting our schools. In DeSoto County, it's about 34,000 students, but just in the first few weeks, based on what the, the numbers that the district has published, about 7,000 students have either tested positive or have been quarantined or have gone virtual or hybrid, um, which is about 20% of the student body in the district. And then there are about 250 staff who have tested positive. That's just the first four weeks of the year. And so my concerns have been that the current plans in place don't give our kids the best chance at staying in school and learning in school. And I think there are real simple and proven measures that could be implemented that would have a big impact at giving our kids the, the best chance to safely stay in the classroom. As a pediatrician, but also as a father, what are your thoughts as you see these numbers? Our family was recently impacted. Uh, my oldest daughter um, developed COVID about a week into the school year and shared with several in, in the family. But having taken care of other kids as well, I see numbers, but I, but I think about kids that I've taken care of, and I think about the impact on them, and I think about the impact on their family, I think about the impact on their learning, their, their experience at school, and the impact on the community at, at large. And I, it's, it's sad to me to see how much impact kids have had from the pandemic over the last couple of years, from school being canceled to being virtual, to, to the impact has been huge, and I think if we can, as a community can do everything we can to give our kids the best experience at school, I think that they deserve that. You, you mentioned this just a moment ago, but transmission from your uh, from your child led to transmission within your family, that you feel schools need to have these measures in place to prevent transmission among students. When I think about 7,000 students in just the first few weeks of class, each of them have missed a substantial portion of time that's really disruptive to that to students to be missing school, 
missing activities, the health risks as well. Certainly, we all have seen that children tend to do much better than adults, which we're very grateful for. But when you get into those higher numbers, just by large numbers of children getting infected, you're going to have more children who end up in the hospital, who end up in the ICU, and unfortunately, we'll see more more children who die. Um, we're seeing that in at the Bonner Children's Hospital in Memphis, um, where which is nearby, and uh, at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital as well. Well, we're seeing more and more kids impacted, and those they're fortunately more rare cases where kids end up needing hospitalization, but they certainly happen. In DeSoto uh, schools, they have chosen not to require masks. What are your thoughts on school districts not taking those measures? I, I recognize that a lot is being asked of schools right now, and these are things that most of them probably never thought that they were going to have to deal with. And so they're certainly in a hard spot. We know that um, decisions like masking, there's a lot of evidence to support them. Masks are safe for both children and adults. They significantly reduce the spread of COVID-19. Um, in addition to masking, there are other things that I think um, the school districts and community leaders can be doing that we can be providing reliable and trustworthy information about vaccination and encouraging vaccination in those who are eligible. We can improve testing, make it more available for both symptomatic and asymptomatic students. And I think school districts can really be a voice for encouraging positive behaviors that will um, help, again, help, help keep kids in school and help our community get through this. Is there anything else we might not have touched on that you'd like to share with uh, other people in Mississippi? Other would be, you know, your concerns as a father who has a child going to a school district in Mississippi or as a pediatrician in terms of reaching out to other parents in the state that you'd like to share? I think as a whole, I mean, everybody's tired of COVID. Everybody's been through a lot. We've heard from parents recently who expressed their concerns about what they're seeing in school. We've, seen, we've heard from teachers who feel like they've been put in a really challenging situation with little that they can do. But we know what we need to do. And there are measures that require very little in terms of resources but can have a huge impact to help put our kids in a better spot. And I think our kids are worth it, and it's important that we uh, make those decisions to put kids first. Well, Dr. Reese, thank you so much for talking with us today. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. Coming up, the story of a Mississippi State football game like no other. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting and depends on the support of listeners like you. If you can, please donate today at mpbonline.org. And thanks. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Karen Brown. Twenty years ago this Saturday, when hijacked planes felled the World Trade Center in New York, it was as though American life froze in place. International travel all but stopped in the aftermath of the attack. U.S. airspace closed completely. Elections were postponed and a week of NCAA football was canceled. The following week's slate of college football games was slated to begin on Thursday, September 20th, with a matchup between South Carolina and Mississippi State. In the days before the game, school administrators, conference leadership, and federal officials traded nervous phone calls. Logistical snarls and safety concerns hung over Davis Wade Stadium like black smoke. But when it comes to football in Mississippi, the show must go on. And welcome back to Starkville, Mississippi. Mississippi State, number 16, getting ready to take on number 20, the South Carolina Gamecocks in an important, somewhat pivotal SEC battle. You know, a lot of people just felt like, you know, as a country, you know, we needed to kind of get back to having you know, some of the things that we enjoy, and it was it was rather quick. Steve Robertson is a longtime Mississippi State football writer. I remember SEC Commissioner uh, Roy Kramer was involved in the discussions, you know, with the White House and people with national security. And, you know, South Carolina was the first team to fly, I mean, after 9-11. You know, we were all just so, so tenderhearted at the time that, you know, football almost seemed you know, so important, but at the same time, I think the chance to kind of gather and huddle together as a community, you know, provided a bit of healing. In the Mississippi State locker room before the game, emotions ran wild. 
Josh Morgan was a safety for that Bulldogs team. We knew that there, there were going to be a lot of eyes uh, on the game, and we were completely honored at the opportunity that we had to be the first televised you know, football game on. We, we recognized and relished that opportunity and were extremely honored and wanted to just perform well and, and give a great representation uh, of our school and our state and uh, of our nation. And uh, so, yeah, you know, it was it was tense and it was uh, all kind of different emotions that were in the locker room. I can remember that very vividly. The stadium was packed well before kickoff. As fans found their seats, Robertson remembers ripples of tension running through the crowd. I think everybody wondered because, you know, it was the first time we'd had a big crowd together again nationally. And you worried a little bit about, you know, copycats or, you know, sleeper cells and things like that. It's like there's going to be, you know, 60,000 people together in one place in a very vulnerable position. You know, at the end of the day, I mean, it doesn't matter how many police officers and first responders you have there. I mean, if somebody wanted to fly a plane into the stadium, you know, there's nothing they could do to stop that. And so, yeah, that was in the back of our minds, too. And, you know, I'd like to say we were all not worried about that. But, yeah, it was there were people on message boards. and That's back, you know, really before the the days of social media. They were concerned, you know, what happens if a plane flies into one of the stadiums? And did that make us somewhat vulnerable? And, And it did. But at the same time, too, I think that we just simply had to kind of move forward. The famous maroon marching band blared America the Beautiful as the two teams processed from the north end zone. They carried between them a massive American flag. Miss Karen, it was the biggest flag that I have ever seen. It, it, it stretched across the field, and I believe it went from the 40 to the 20. Uh, the band was on one side of the field, and the flag was on the other. Our entire team was on one side of the flag, and South Carolina's team was wrapped around the other side of the flag. And that was uh, that was a moment, and again, that we were so blessed to be a part of. But that was, uh, I can remember looking at my teammates beside us, and we were all kind of had the same thought process. There's no way we're letting this flag touch the ground. <laughs> and and uh, chants of USA were, were the, the theme instead of, you know, it being about Mississippi State and South Carolina, the entire stadium, the entire both groups and cheerleaders and both players and staff and an entire if you were in that stadium it was just usa usa and and that was a moment and that as a a player you get to experience a lot of things but to hear that chant at that moment buckle your knees and you know put it in perspective how big not just necessarily the game was but the event itself Please join Bunny Sherman. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's One of the things that I remember so much about that ball game is the national anthem and how so many people had their American flags and then on the field they had that huge American flag out there and it didn't really matter who won the ball game. I think it was just a matter of, of us letting the world know that our quality of life was not going to be diminished by this and our way of doing things was not going to be erased and that we, we just weren't going to cower in the face of terrorism. And It was one of those things that I, I just really felt there was a real esprit de corps among all the fans from all schools, and I think America really needed that game to happen. There wasn't a dry eye in the house when that national anthem was played, and there was just such this – this feeling of patriotism when they rolled that huge American flag out there. And, uh, you know, both teams were involved in the ceremonies. And it was just in many ways, I think, kind of a healing uh, moment, not just for Mississippi State and South Carolina, but for the entire country. I think the outcome of the ball game was really kind of secondary to the fact that we kind of gathered together as a community and, and, and went out and just kind of celebrated the American way of life. Of course, it's easy to say the outcome of the game didn't matter when Mississippi State lost 16 to 14. If, if you just want to rub it in. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I think we, I think we played okay. I think we played okay. I think we had a, you know, big expectations going into it. And Coach Holtz was coaching South Carolina at that time and, and uh, he had them up and coming. And it was a, a typical SEC game, it was a typical hard fault game and, and, uh, real physical. And, and, uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of what I remember of it. I think it gave the rest of the country a little bit of confidence to say, okay, we can kind of get back 
to doing some of the things we love. But, uh, you know, there, there were some players on both teams that, that were impacted by, you know, the attacks in New York. I know one of the Mississippi State players, his sister, was actually driving by the World Trade Center when it fell, and she, she died in, in that carnage. It was just one of those things, you know, the co- college colors always separate us so much. You know, it's, kind of, it's a divider in many respects. So on that night, we were all kind of united in our grief and our resolve that we would get back to being Americans. I just remember just the perspective of it all. You know, we, we wanted to win now. Don't get me wrong. We wanted to win. We wanted to win for those sta- uh, fans in that stadium and for just being as competitors. But when you watched everything transpire over the week and a half and, and perspective changed, it, it just changed. You know, your, your, your heart goes uh, for the people that are hurting and mourning. And, yeah, you know, it's just a little bit – it's a different perspective. We sure did want to win. We wanted to play good. Uh, but at the end of the day, it was, you know, after it's all the dust is clear, there's still a sense of reality there. And But, uh, you know, we knew our job was give everybody something to cheer about for three four hours and kind of take their minds off of it. And I think we were able to do that. Our thanks to Steve Robertson and Josh Morgan for sharing their stories. Thanks for listening to the Mississippi Edition podcast from MPB News and MPB Think Radio. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. And if your app lets you, leave a comment or review. We really do appreciate it. Remember, you can always get in touch with MPB News on Facebook and Twitter. And fresh episodes of the podcast are posted every weekday morning. I'm Karen Brown. Thanks for listening. This is Mississippi.